most diseases on the planet, the diseases that kill us are 80, 90% caused by aging. It really is the cause. If you slow down aging, you don't get sick. You don't get those diseases. And now we have an ability to even reverse some aspects of aging. Aging, none of us can escape. Like gravity, it pulls on each of us. Why do some of us age gracefully and others don't? How do our bodies and minds experience aging at the cellular and molecular level? Why do we even age to begin with? And maybe most importantly, can we do anything about it? My name is Gordon Lithgow, and here at the Buck Institute in California, my colleagues and I are searching for and actually finding answers to these questions and many more. On this podcast, we discuss and discover the future of aging with some of the brightest scientific stars on the planet. We're not getting any younger, yet. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking with a friend and colleague today, an amazing scientist, David Sinclair, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, and also the host of a podcast, Lifespan, with David Sinclair. And today, David's going to be on the other side of the microphone, and I'm going to be asking him about his amazing career and where the aging field is today. I think you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. Well, hello, David. Uh, it's delightful to see you, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. I actually don't think we've seen each other for a couple of years, right? Uh, not Certainly not since your book was published, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, which was a New York Times bestseller. Congratulations on that. I, I really like this book for a number of reasons. One is that you explain the biology of aging in a way that is understandable to, to just about any reader. Secondly, you describe your own personal journey getting into aging, which is fascinating. And then, and then third, you, I think you, you set up the social context for where this field is today. And I really would like to talk to you about that. Well, thanks, Gordon. Yeah, it's, it's been too long since we spoke last. We have a lot to talk about. And uh, yeah, thanks for saying those kind of things about the book. Um, the field has exploded and I was very lucky to have written a book just at the right time. You know, I think that there's, as uh, Eric Verdon here at the Buck says, a sort of inflection point on aging research. And the inflection point is really how do we communicate this to the rest of the world that something incredible has happened and is happening? And how do we ensure that the resources are there to, to make it happen? So, yeah, we've got lots to talk about. Do you mind if we go back, though, to the beginnings? Why did you become a scientist? And I know you, you um, address this quite a bit in your book with your, the, your family influences. So I'd like to unpack that a little bit, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Well, I grew up in a family that was uh, filled with biology. My parents are biologists. And uh, they would talk about uh, urine and feces and blood at the dinner table. Uh, so there, really, there wasn't really much choice. I had to become a biologist. Was there a single moment where you kind of realized that aging was the thing that was important to you? Uh, yep. Yeah, since the age of four, really, uh, it's been on my mind. Uh, my grandmother told me that uh, she was going to die and my parents would die. My cat would die. That was even more traumatic um, at the time. <laughs> And I remember falling down on the carpet. It was a very prickly 1970s polyester thing. Um, and uh, yeah, it shaped my life as, ever since. I really do think it's it's quite cruel uh, for a species to have consciousness and know what's coming. And I think it's our duty to protect human life and it, keep people as healthy as possible. That's what medical research is about. I just also think, and I, I've grown more mature about this over the years, that addressing aging is is going to give us the biggest bang for the buck, excuse the pun, that um, you know, most diseases on the planet, especially now um, in the developed world and, and, and a lot of the rest of the world now, the diseases that kill us are 80, 90% caused by aging. Uh, and medicine just sticks Band-Aids on the end product of those processes. Yeah, I really like, you know that I like this. I like the fact you used the word cause there. I think that's something we can agree on. And, and But it's, it's something that's that's... Uh, still very much not accepted by even the general biomedical community, never mind practicing uh, physicians. Well, it's true. We, we've separated aging out as something distinct when it's completely not the case. It really is the cause. Some of the tests you can do for that is if you slow down aging, you don't get sick, you don't get those diseases. And now we have an ability to even reverse some aspects of 
of aging, and you can mm -hmm. treat diseases that way uh, and actually cure them. And so, uh, for example, we can uh, reverse the age of a mouse's brain and it regains its ability to learn. So that these are pointing or screaming at us saying, aging is the root cause of these diseases. And if you stay young, they don't occur typically. Fantastic. And I definitely want to get into your research and some of your terrific recent papers and, and unpack some of that. Uh, tell me about Robert Mortimer. So Robert Mortimer, uh, who's now no longer with us, was a giant in the yeast aging field. Uh, he was a generous, um, a brilliant, warm guy who I looked up to as a, as a kid when I was learning yeast genetics uh, in my late teens, early 20s. And uh, I got to know him because I needed some yeast strains, some types of yeast for my PhD. Um, and I wrote to him and I said, could I have some yeast? And he would just he and his lab would put them in the mail and mail them out. And that's the way science used to be done. These days, it's a lot more complicated. Typically, you have to sign documents and there's all sorts of approvals. But in those days, people would just share their science and just be happy that they were spreading goodwill to the community. Um, and I got to meet him uh, just once when I went to Vienna for an international conference. I think I was 22 at the time. And uh, that was a, a life-changing experience. I'd never been to an international conference before, and there were probably a thousand people who were working on this little organism, this mm. little yeast mm. cell. And it was probably the best time to have gone to a yeast conference because the, the organism was becoming extremely famous within scientific circles. And we were just discussing, well, they were discussing, and I was listening about reading the entire yeast genome. And the mind boggled yeah, because... Just to read one gene in those days took months of work and uh, it was hazardous. There were dangerous chemicals, there was glass and electricity involved. And to have the knowledge of the complete yeast genome that really only took another few years to complete was a total revolution that preceded um, and, and really just showed the world what it was going to be like in a world where we knew the genome of humans as well. Yeah, I was actually working on yeast uh, for my PhD around about the same time. And one, one thing I don't think we've ever talked about this is that uh, my undergraduate mentor was Johnny Johnson. And Johnny Johnson was the co-author with Bob Mortimer on a very famous paper in Nature in, uh, I guess it was 1959. So six years after Watson, Crick, Franklin uh, uh, published The Structure of DNA, this paper appears in Nature, which I, I'm sure you know very well. Right, yeah. Um... Mortimer and Johnson, uh, they were the first to show that yeast cells get old in a formal way. And that was the basis of my postdoctoral work at MIT with Lenny Garenti, uh, dissecting yeast cells. I guess it, it was a small world in those days, so it's not surprising we're connected that way. Yeah, well, so, so Johnny Johnson had this dream life. He had six months in Scotland teaching us kids some genetics. And then he would have six months in Berkeley working with Bob. And, uh, and I thought that was just the, the perfect existence. But the question I had for you is, 1959, why wasn't yeast aging genetics or the biology of aging happening through the 60s and 70s? And really, it took until the 80s before things started to take off. Well, my guess is that people didn't believe that yeast were relevant to human biology. They don't get yeah. cancer. They don't get Alzheimer's disease. So how could you possibly learn about something so complicated as aging from a little tiny yeast cell. Uh, and then it, it really just became clear through the 1970s and 80s that you could actually learn about human biology from yeast. There are a number of Nobel Prizes awarded, such as uh, the folks that discovered how the cell cycle is controlled. Paul Nurse is uh, you know, a name that comes to mind. And so yeah, that yeah. really showed that, hey, if we can understand the cell cycle uh, and it can win Nobel Prizes, then you know, maybe aging is something that might be relevant too. Your book is in some ways a thesis on the idea that the aging is is about information, the information theory of aging. And uh, I, I guess we do go back to your early experiments with yeast and the discovery of, of sirtuins as, as modulators of lifespan in this single celled organism. Um, tell us about sirtuins. They deserve credit for finding a mutant strain of yeast that was resistant to starvation um, and it also happened to live about 30% longer based on the number of divisions that the mother cells could do. And I arrived on the scene then, and the question was, well, what is that gene and what is it doing? Uh, and the gene mutation at the time was in 
SIR4, Silent Information Regulator number oh, four. Right. Yeah. And the the and and then SIR2 came in because SIR2 is the one that's in humans. SIR4 is not well conserved. But so SIR2 gave rise to the SIR2ins, which are pretty famous in scientific circles and and increasingly uh, in the public's uh, eye. And uh, and so in those days we were trying to figure out what the heck was a silent information regulator, a gene regulator doing controlling aging that made no sense. At the time, the prevailing theory was DNA damage, free radical damage was causing aging. Uh, and so to have this gene regulator was a total shock. And what we came up with, with was the idea that the SIR4 and SIR2 proteins were um, controlling an aging gene. We didn't know what it was. It was called the age locus, which is really a part of the genome that you don't have a good name for. And then uh, we figured out what was going on. We, we went on to show that SIR4 moves away from where it normally is, regulating genes involved in fertility, uh, to a highly uh, unstable part of the yeast genome called the ribosomal DNA, which is very repetitive. Uh, and one of the first things I showed was that the ribosomal DNA is, is an Achilles heel for that organism. Um, and little bits of DNA pop out from that region and choke the cell and kill it. Uh, but uh, as part of that process, these SIR proteins leave their post and go to try and help repair the DNA that is highly unstable. And by leaving their post, you lose the silencing of genes involved in fertility and sex determination, which you'll know as A and alpha, which is male and female in yeast. And that's what gives rise to the, the sterility of old yeast cells which at the time, and I, I think Mortimer, John, Mortimer Johnson may have figured this out, um, or it might have been Michael Jaswinski later, that old yeast cells are sterile, and that's a hallmark of yeast aging. And that led to the whole theory of really what we still work on in my lab, which is that the changes to gene expression due to relocalization of the sirtuin proteins and others, of course, are a, a key component of the aging process. So at the time, I mean, you obviously knew that these genes were conserved in mammals, but did you even dare to think that they would be relevant for mammalian aging? Yeah, we were pretty arrogant in those days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did like to think that we were uncovering um, secrets of, of general biology that would be conserved in mammals. And we really did believe that, uh, that there would be homologs of sirtuins in mammals and that they would control aging somehow. Uh, and that yeah. perhaps... And I, I was dreaming and we started testing in my lab when I moved to Harvard in 1999 that the main homologue of SIR2, which is SIR-T1, there were seven of them, number one, was going to also silence genes and control genes involved in aging and move to double-stranded DNA breaks or DNA instability, including the RDNA. Um, and for the most part, that, that turns out to be consistent with all the results that we've had in mammals since. But it is funny, you know, no one's ever asked me that, Gordon, whether we really thought that we were going to change the world, but we really did. We had this, there was this energy in the lab that we could really do amazing things. And uh, it, I haven't had such an experience um, like that where a whole lab has this fever about it that, you know, we're really doing something that's going to change the course of human history. Now, we, we could have failed. It could have been just complete arrogance, but um, we definitely had this feeling wherever that came from, I don't know, but... Fortunately, some of it was turned out to be true. Okay, well, let's drill down on this information theory of aging, and, and we've got to talk about epigenetics and maybe just define some, some terms here. You're already talking about gene expression changes as a re result of these movements of, of sirtuins from site to site. So what's, what's epigenetics? Epigenetics is a term that was coined, um, well, in the middle of the century, last century to describe the phenomenon that you can inherit characteristics from your parents and even from cell to cell that are not genetic. And, uh, you know, the, the, what, what became clear was that the epigenetic inheritance was, was alterable. It could switch. It could change. It was alterable by uh, the environment, temperature. Uh, for example. And uh, though people at the time had no idea what epigenetics was at the physical level, at the molecular level, um, now we know that, that epigenetics is 
really the, the mechanisms that stably control gene expression, how genes are controlled. Um, and for the most part, it refers to the inheritance of those states, though it's become a little lax these days. Epigenetics tends to refer to anything that controls genes, which is really not where the, the term originally started from. Right, right. So this is modifications to both DNA and to proteins that are associated with DNA, right? It is. And those proteins then wrap the DNA up into bundles, tight bundles, which is a process of silencing genes, um, as well as contacting different regions together. So DNA is not just a string that's flopping around. It's actually organized into bundles and large loops. And the large loops are often genes that together are turned on, such as developmental genes that control your head to your tail, the Hox genes. Um, and so it's think of epigenetics as, well, I know you know it, but um, listeners may not understand that epigenetics involves chemical modifications to the DNA and to the, the packing proteins um, that are called histones, as well as proteins that, that control large-scale looping of, of many thousands of letters on the DNA. And it's that three-dimensional structure that turns out to be really important for whether a gene remains switched off for 100 years, you know, if someone lives that long, or is switched on. Um, and you can actually change the whether a loop is open or closed, sometimes just by um, the time of day or what you eat, that these structures are either very stable in terms of um, the ones that are important for aging or the ones that control metabolism and stress responses such as heat shock, they can, they can change rapidly within seconds. I mean, what, what blows me away is, is the technology that we now have at our disposal to look at this. So, I mean, just, just, just describe that. How many, how many sites of DNA are we talking about? How many pieces of DNA are we looking at at any given time? Well, uh, so we're, we're looking at, uh, these days, you can look at the entire genome, so billions of letters in a single day for a couple of hundred dollars, which used to cost uh, about a couple of billion dollars and take a few years and a few buildings and, and countries involved. Uh, so that's that's where we've come. So now you can do it really in your, in your home, what used to require governments to do. And what we can do now is not just read the letters, but to look at how they're modified by chemical changes, such as methylation, which is a carbon and three hydrogens. Uh, but you can also look now at what, what boggles my mind is we can look across the genome at how it's structured in three dimensions and then in time, four dimensions, and see what parts are talking to other parts. And that's very important because there are things called enhancers, which are regions of DNA that loop around and touch genes and make them get turned on. And that's very important too. And so you shouldn't think of DNA just as a, as a string. It's actually a, uh, a three-dimensional um, chemical that moves and vibrates and bundles and opens up and touches other regions. And, um, and so chromosomes are really dynamic when you really drill down. But getting at the technology, my head spins when I see how fast this changes, that the price comes down and how many experiments we can do. Uh, just to give one, one sense of it, what took me three months to do in my PhD, which was to read three genes, um, you could do a million of those experiments in, in just an, a day as a graduate student now. Amazing, amazing. Um, well, okay, so the information theory is the idea that this complex machinery you're describing degrades in different ways with age. I guess in your book, you use this analogy to DVDs. We might have to explain to some of our listeners what DVDs are. <laughs> but uh, you, <laughs> you do use this analogy between a sort of the difference between a broken DVD and a scratch DVD. Can you, can you relate that to, to chromatin and epigenetics? Right. So, so there's two main types of information that are, is carried in our cells. We inherit, of course, the DNA, the genome from our parents, which is pretty stable throughout most of our life. We have mutations, but not a great deal. Uh, we can clone animals from, from skin cells. So clearly it's not all completely messed up. Um, and we can grow new organs from, from iPSCs derived from human cells. So we, we do know that the genome is pretty stable. In fact, you can read it in Neanderthal's DNA uh, or you know, 20,000 years old DNA. It's pretty stri um, strikingly stable chemical. Now, the other part of information in the cell is the epigenome. And the epigenome is really far less stable than DNA. And it's in part because it's, it's not just digital. There is some digital components such as methylation, but these loops are analog. They are vibrating structures 
uh, they move, uh, they can be deformed. They can, and, and trying to maintain analog information is very difficult over time, as anyone who is over the age of 30 will attest, uh, who might have used a cassette tape or a record. I guess some young people now use records still. Um, so these, these forms of analog storage are really poor at copying. You lose information every time you copy a cassette tape or a record. Um, and, uh, and so the analogy, actually, what I, I like to use is, is a DVD, which contains digital information, which represents the DNA. So the music or the movie that you read, the little ones and zeros represent the DNA. And then the reader of the genes would be that little laser that moves around and reads, reads the disc. Um, and what I like to think of aging as is a scratches on the disc so that the reader cannot fully access the genes at the right time in the right place. And the, similar to aging, what we think is happening is that genes are beautifully read at the right time when we're young, but over time, the systems, the epigenetic systems that read those become, um, well, they, they, they malfunction in the same way a scratch CD or DVD would, would uh, skip and the music starts to sound horrible. Um, our genome is read in a horrible way as we get older. Uh, but the, it's interesting that if you have a scratched DVD, you can actually polish it and allow that movie or that music to be played beautifully again, um, as opposed to if you break the DVD, it's, you've got no chance because you've lost the information. Um, but I don't think that's what aging is. I think that aging is surprisingly reversible um, and that the epigenome turns out to have a reset switch in the same way that we can polish those scratches off. So, and this gets to your, your, your work on uh, regeneration and reversibility of, of aging in certain tissues. And um, first of all, give us an insight into how that's even possible and then maybe describe, you know, one of the, your major discoveries in doing that. Well, I've been inspired by Claude Shannon, who came up with the mathematics that led to the internet and his paper in 1948 called The Mathematical Theory of Communication, came up with the idea that you should have a backup copy of your, of your uh, message, and that if it doesn't make it to the sender perfectly, you can go back and retrieve some of that information. Um, and it dawned on me uh, back in 2014 that it, it's a good analogy for aging, that if there, we definitely lose information, right? We, we know some of the, 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 the noise that leads to the loss of the, the uh, the ability to read the genome. Double-stranded DNA breaks is one. Genomic instability in yeast I was mentioning is a, a major cause of that. We now know that, that just crushing a nerve will accelerate its age, so that's another way to do it. Uh, but what Claude Shannon did brilliantly was to say, let's create a backup copy. And so what I dreamt of was maybe there is a backup copy of a youthful epigenetic state. Maybe we can polish the scratches without destroying the actual original information. Now, we know that it's possible to reset the age of the cell of an adult cell back to zero. This is what Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for in 2016. He found a set of four genes that when you turn them on in an adult cell will reset its age, erase all the epigenetic marks, uh, get rid of the DNA methylation and, uh, and start again. But that's not gonna be useful for resetting aging. That would just be a great way to cause tumors, which is not what we're about. And so I dreamed of maybe there's a way to partially reset the epigenome. Maybe there's a, a, a storage of what the epigenome used to look like when we were young, when a cell was young, that could be accessed and retrieve that information, like Claude Shannon said, um, and allow the cell to function and read the genes like it did earlier without going back to being a stem cell, a pluripotent stem cell. And we didn't know that that was possible until about three years ago when we did a critical experiment where we found a combination of genes, three genes from the Yamanaka set that safely reset the epigenome and brought gene expression back to a state that was much younger without transforming it into a cancer cell. I remember that experiment, David. It's fascinating. Tell me more about how that experiment worked out. My brilliant uh, student at the time, Wan Cheng Lu, was, uh, was about to quit. He'd been trying for two years different combinations of... Um, of age resetting potential factors. And he was going through genes that would normally be turned on during embryogenesis. Cause we reasoned that embryos stay young when, when they're first formed. So why couldn't we do that? But he kept turning on 
oncogenes uh, and such mm -hmm. as Nanog, and yeah. he was getting pretty frustrated. He almost quit. And uh, it's a true story. He he was nearly in tears saying, I, have, I can't do this anymore. I don't think I can finish my PhD, which is the moment mm -hmm. that most graduate students go through before they have a big breakthrough. And uh, so we decided to try one experiment, which was to leave out one of the Yamanaka genes and try the experiment again, which was uh, we left out an oncogene called CMIC, uh, M for short. Uh, and he tried it again in, in cells. Still, we hadn't tested any mice. Um, and it worked. The cells went back in age. They became youthful. They functioned nicely. They didn't become senescent. Um, we delayed senescence. Um, and it was, it was a eureka moment. But then we wanted to know, can you do this in a living organism, which would be something quite different? And we chose the eye as an experimental system. We chose the eye for a number of reasons. Um, one is that if you damage your optic nerve when you're old or even just an adult, it doesn't regrow, but a very young animal will. Uh, we also chose the eye because gene therapy works in humans is, is permitted by the Food and Drug Administration. And so we thought if, if it worked, we could actually treat blindness. Um, and then the third, Yuan Cheng Lu, the student, had a passion for the eye. His, so all of that, I said, yeah, go ahead. Let's do that. And the experiment was to uh, blind a mouse by damaging its optic nerve and then putting in those three Yamanaka genes to see if we could reverse aging and allow them to grow mm -hmm. back. Uh, and that was a turning point in my lab where uh, Wan Cheng texted me an image of nerve cells regrowing back to the brain. Wow. And it was a, it was a eureka moment for sure. And Wang mm -hmm. Cheng said, uh, do you see what I'm seeing? And I said, yeah, I, I see the future. Uh, and, uh, and it was, it really was a turning point. My lab now, for the most part, works on reprogramming uh, and the role of sirtuins and DNA damage and DNA methylation and clocks. So yeah, we really, that was a leap forward. Um, later, we went on to show that gene expression, the, the patterns of genes on and off were much more youthful and genes that went down a little bit with aging went up a little bit with reprogramming. But interestingly, genes that go down a lot come back up a lot with reprogramming and vice versa, up, down, up, down. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what that tells us is it's not just that the cell re remembers which genes to fix in terms of, you know, just change the expression, but, but by how much? There's a place and a rheostat. And we don't know where that backup information is stored, how it's stored. Um, I would love for somebody to figure that out. We're trying. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's one of the big questions is how, how does the cell know which are the genes that need to be reset to, to be able to restore its identity, but not become so young that it loses its ability to function? Yeah, no, it's incredible. And I presume now you're doing this in different tissues and uh, different disease models. Oh, yeah. So we're doing the brain. We're growing little mini human brains. And in mice, we're resetting the age of the old brain and seeing that they regain their ability to learn tasks again, which is cool. We're trying to figure out if you regain lost memories. That would be fun to see and <laughs> important for, for dementia. Uh, we're, we're testing muscle and we've got skin as a project now. There's a lot of people interested in the regrowth of hair and, uh, and hair color. Um, yeah, so we just Tell me about it. Off. <laughs> yeah, so we, we'll try that. We've got little skin organoids. Um, Carl Curler's lab at Harvard grows these little balls of skin. And they're quite disgusting. The hair actually grows inward. Um, but <laughs> we now have the ability to age those. We can make them 60, 70 years old. Um, remember, to make a skin organoid, you actually have to go through a stem cell stage, Yamanaka reprogramming. So they, yeah. they have to go back to age zero. And then what we do is we age them, and now we're de-aging them. Um, so it's a lot of fun. We have really good, precise control over uh, organs and tissues mm. now um, in organoids, in the dish, and also in the animal. Yeah. So you mentioned senescence. So we're going to be speaking with uh, Judy Campisi about her work in senescence. Um, where do you see cellular senescence fitting in with this worldview of reprogramming that you have? Well, it's it's part of the, the whole hypothesis, part of the continuum of um, epigenetic noise. The end product of, of the loss of cellular identity is that the cell just says, I give up, I check out of the cell cycle. And we can see that when we accelerate epigenetic noise um, and during normal aging, cells will check out of the cell cycle. Sometimes it's caused by telomere loss, but not always. Sometimes it's just that the cell forgets what it is and says, uh, I think I'm a bit dangerous for the organism I'm going to check out. And so what we're doing is we're now inducing senescence, of course, in mice, but also in, in, in these skin organoids. 
uh, and in, in flat cultures across the dish with, with skin fibroblasts. Um, and we're, we're looking at whether we can reverse the senescent state using reprogramming. Now, dogma would tell you that that's dangerous, that these cells are terminally uh, checked out of the cell cycle for a good reason. Um, and it, yeah. it would be very dangerous and, and also very difficult to re restore them to normal. Um, but preliminary results in my lab say that it, it might, might not be that difficult or that dangerous. And you think this is a, a better strategy than simply removing those cells with senolytic drugs or other approaches? It could be. I mean, senolytic drugs are really promising, and I think they're really simple. It's a simple solution. But you don't want to kill off senescent stem cells. You don't want to kill off senescent neurons if there are those things. And so I think that ultimately it'd be great if we could preserve the cells that we need, even if they've become senescent. But for now, of course, we, we get rid of them and that's the best we can do. But ultimately, you know, it, I think I liken senescent cells. Another analogy would be that these are zombies. And, uh, you know, it's okay to go crazy with a machine gun and shoot all the zombies until, you know, one of those zombies is your, is your family member. You might want to figure out a cure for the zombies instead. I just want to go back to metabolism and, you know, you and others have clearly made inroads into understanding how to modulate epigenetic fate and uh, through changes in, in energy metabolism. So can you say something about that? Yeah, so metabolism is one of the easiest things to correct, actually. The, the changes to the epigenome in metabolism are already really dynamic. And uh, many others bes besides my lab have shown that uh, restricting calories and also when calories are consumed is able to uh, greatly improve metabolism. Um, and there's increasing evidence that that's also a way to slow down ticking of the epigenetic clock. Um, but yeah, you know, the reason that I my lab is focused on muscle and fat and metabolism and glucose metabolism is that it's super easy to reverse. Um, but I, I do like metabolism as, as a starting point for understanding why we age and, and how to reverse aspects of it. And uh, it's been really fruitful, actually, for the field, I think, to focus in on metabolism. And a lot of the genes that came out early in the days um, when you were, uh, you know, one of my heroes was, uh, well, you still are, but when I first came upon your work was to understand um, cell to cell signaling. Um, and uh, of course, in C. elegans, the insulin signaling pathway was for front and foremost and also in flies. And that is a major controller of metabolism. It's, it's what, you know, what is insulin and it's like growth factor if it's not controlling metabolism and cell growth. And so, yeah, and that's where the field began, really. And it taught us a lot about the relationship between, between calories, between hormones and, and the aging process at the cellular level. Yeah, we're trying to learn metabolism. Uh, you know, we, we recently showed that uh, alpha ketoglutarate, uh, the TCE cycle metabolite, was having a... It's always been... That's been known for many years. So Kuhn Lab published the extended lifespan in, in C. elegans in the worm. Uh, but it, it seems to also extend lifespan in the mouse. But more importantly, it seems to it seems to compress morbidity. You've talked a lot about health span. Did, did you have a, a sort of a goal there when thinking about, you know, developing drugs? I've wanted to compress morbidity and extend human health as my life's goal. And then I, I work back from there how to do that. You know, get a PhD, do a postdoc, get a lab. Um, so, you know, if, if you understand that, you see why I develop drugs, because that's the next logical step to achieve what I'm trying to do before I die. Um, and so commercialization is a big part of that. Most ideas will die if you don't have a, um, a champion. And the scientist is typically that champion. You've got to be that person because there's just too many ideas and there's too many distractions. And there's not enough money for, to go around. Um, and so what I, I've done in my career is to take the best findings from my lab and, and those that I've seen around the world and direct money towards it in, in a way to uh, improve human health and, and extend health span. It's, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, in making people live longer if it's not uh, a healthy life and an enjoyable life. I mean, that, that's what modern medicine is. It's keeping people alive while their brains get old. That, I have no interest in doing that. Just a final point about with the societal change that that this 
this science could engender. And I know you think about this. And I know the first thing that people say to us when we talk about health span, lifespan extension is, what are you doing to the planet? Do you want to just close on a, a couple of thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sad that we have to end. Um, I I do want to, I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, but remind me to get back to some of your research, because I do want to ask you a question. Um, so it's societal effects. So the, the, a lot of people are worried about what happens when you make people live longer. We've always worried about that. You know, I'm sure when mm -hmm. antibiotics were invented, people were wondering, what are we going to do with all these people that survive? Um, and we've been trained, especially those that, that grew up um, in the era of um, Paul Ehrlich and his books about the end of the world and population growth. We, we were worried that we're all going to starve to death. That's not going to happen. We have more food than we could feed twice over the whole planet, really. We know how to grow food. It's a question of environmental degradation. That's the problem. Um, countries mm -hmm. or, or continents such as South America and Africa are realizing as a whole that educating a couple of children is the way to go. And I know this firsthand. I visited Africa a couple of years ago. And so that means we're going to top out as a species at around 10 billion and start to decline actually after that. Now, if we start slowing aging, it's not going to make a big difference. I mean, the only thing that would make a big difference is if we become immortal. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, not within no, our no. lifetimes, that's for sure. Right. I'm not an immortalist. I'm a, I think I'm pretty realistic about it. So it's going to happen slowly. People will start to live a few years longer. Those who do the right things might get an, another decade or, or even two decades if they do all the right things. We already know that just doing five of the right things about drinking and sleeping and not smoking and all those things um, gives you another 14 years on average. So it's it's not crazy to think we could live that long on average. But yeah. um, even if we do that, the point is that population growth isn't going to be a problem. What do we need to do? We need to d redirect resources into understanding how to live better on the planet, have less impact, how to recycle, how to grow crops without degrading the environment. Um, I've recently given up meat um, and all dairy, actually, in part because of the planet and in part because it's. I see a lot of science pointing towards that being healthy, uh, particularly for long-term health, maybe not as much short-term. Um, and, you know, I'm, 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 I can always debate the, the carnivores on that. But, yeah, no, getting back to the main point, I think that by, by making people healthier and live longer and being productive and spending money, rather than costing money in hospitals and in nursing homes for the last 10 years of their life. The economy is, is going to boom. The world is going to be a better place. My colleagues in London were calculating that the cost savings to the United States by just delaying aging by one year uh, would save, in the long run, $86 trillion. And if it's 10 years, $365 trillion. That's money that can be mm -hmm. not wasted on sick care, which I call it, versus health care, uh, it can actually be put yeah. towards research and development of ways to protect the planet and allow us to exist on this rocky little uh, uh, ball without having to find new places to live. It's stunning. It's, you know, and I know Jill Shansky has done some of these calculations in the past based on what we could achieve in, in, in mice in a lab. And these, these numbers are just astronomical. Um, I, you had a question for me, David. I did. So alpha ketoglutarate, super exciting. Um, I'm taking it. Um, I'm having a look what it does to me. I'm an experimentalist on myself, so I, mm -hmm. I science the crap out of myself, as Matt Damon would say. And I, I haven't got any results yet, but I'm excited at the possibility of reversing my epigenetic age, uh, my DNA methylation yeah. clock, which was recently shown in a paper and also in mice. Uh, the mouse results that you guys have are just stunning. There's very few molecules that are that beneficial to health span and lifespan. And so my question to you is, how did you know to test alpha ketoglutarate? And second of all, do you think it works through the TET enzymes, which do control the DNA methylation epigenetic clock? Uh, yeah, so, well, uh, we, we started looking at AKG simply because it kept turning up in screens in, in the nematode C. elegans for lifespan extension. And we were interested in combinations of natural products for commercialization reasons. We're being funded by a foundation at that point. And uh, it just it seemed to play well with other molecules. And so it was, it was always a, a something that we thought would be a candidate to get into mouse. And um, it, you, really, the, 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 the results that we published were the controls, because we're actually looking for additional effects of other molecules. 
and you know we'll see if they wash out in the end uh in, in you know various combinations but um no, we're, we're super excited about it. I mean, the, the compression of, of morbidity was unexpected. I, I can't really explain it um, to myself quite yet. Uh, we, uh, Ryan Kennedy, as you probably know, is doing some clinical trials in, in Singapore. We're very excited to see what happens there. And uh, and we got a lot of interest everywhere we go. Last week, we were at an aging center, and, and they were saying, let's do some clinical trials. So it's uh, it's, it's definitely um, yeah, it's definitely a winner. It's one of those eureka moments you're talking about. Do you know how it's slowing down the clock or reversing it? No, we don't know. No. All right. Well, I, I would put money on it activating the DNA demethylases for all of those aficionados listening. That's where my money yeah, is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about the clinical trials. So that, that's where we're at. Sometimes I speak to reporters who uh, say, oh, yeah, it sounds like science fiction. Maybe in 100 years we'll have this technology. And I say, no, no, no. There's clinical trials going on right now in many different companies. Your molecule, my molecules, my minor NAD boosters. We had some positive results just last week. So yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. someone's going to succeed in getting one of these drugs out onto the market that probably is initially for a disease, not for aging, which of course is not yet considered a disease, but it should be, in my view. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yes. we are at a t turning point in human history, and I'm not exaggerating. I don't feel I'm exaggerating when I say that we're finally tackling what we should have been tackling for over 100 years now, which is the root cause of diseases that plague us um, the longer we live and the healthier we think we are. We're actually ignoring the main cause of suffering on the planet. But finally, we, it's not just us small band of brothers that it used to be. Remember, it's just a handful of us at Gordon Conferences up in the Alps you know, wondering why doesn't the world care? Now the world really cares. The spotlight's on us and billions of dollars are being put into this field. And so that's what's super exciting. And that's why I say it's no longer an if, just a when all of this comes true. So one of the challenges that we have is, is measuring aging. And, and, and also that the challenge there is that when we have an intervention that we think might be slowing or reversing aging, how do you actually measure it? And th there's been a lot of popularity around methylation clocks. Can you just explain what those are? These DNA methylation clocks, sometimes called the Horvath clock, after our good colleague Steve Horvath at UCLA, what they are are they they're really just measuring chemical changes on the DNA that occur predictably over time, and they can be clocks of the blood, clocks of skin. Uh, in mice, we do brain clocks, liver clocks, even kidney clocks. But there are, there are these common sites, common clocks that are so-called universal that can be used to determine the age of any tissue, and even between species, there are clocks and little sites on, on the genes that change the same in sheep and bats and even humans and so and even whales. And so this, what this tells us is a couple of things. It's not just a parlor trick. It's not just a way to estimate your biological age. It's actually more important than that. What it tells us is that the epigenome, which these marks are part of, um, is a component of aging itself. And the, some of the evidence of that is the following. When we drive aging forward in our mice in my lab and we give them aging, which we can do by creating some genome instability, the clock advances. We can make a mouse 50% older than its sibling that was born on the same day. And that involves changes in the clock and they get aging. But I think more importantly, when we reverse aging by reprogramming those mouse tissues and the cells that we grow in the dish, if we stop the clock from being reversed, and we can do that by disrupting enzymes that are required to change those chemicals, then mm -hmm. the cells don't get younger. And here's the really mm -hmm. important thing. The cells don't function as though they're young anymore. So in re the reversal of blindness, curing blindness in mice, needed yeah. the clock to be reversed, needed the those methyl chemicals to be removed, which tells us that the clock itself, or at least the DNA methylation patterns, which the clock represents, is not just like a clock on the wall, it actually represents time itself. They're part of the aging process and required for the reversal step as well, which is really cool. That really brings us to a point where now we can measure our age and you can do that. There are some tests that you can buy commercially that are somewhat accurate. Um, and then you can also, we can also now measure if interventions such as alpha ketoglutarate or my uh, NAD boosters affect the yeah. rate of aging and even potentially reverse the rate of aging. Wow, terrific. So David, if you were a PhD student now, would you be? Would you get into aging? Oh yeah, as soon as possible, right? <laughs> this field is taking off. Um, 
in five years, there'll be so many people in it that it'll be hard to distinguish yourself, but it's still a really good time to get into it. There's so much money pouring into aging research from the government, particularly also from philanthropists in the billions of dollars that are, you know, it's going to lead to new jobs. There are going to be new departments. It's, there's never been a better time to get into aging research right now. I completely agree. Fantastic. So you just emerged from your PhD in some subject, maybe neuroscience or a disease model or something. And you're, you're, you're seeing the excitement that you're describing here. How, how, do you, how do you design your first experiment? What does that look like? Oh, well, here's my trick. And I think good scientists, yourself included, have learned this trick. Uh, you don't look at the technology. You don't try and figure out what you think might be the next experiment. You start with a really good question and then work back from there and figure out how you're going to answer that question. But all of the papers that we've published um, have started with a really good question. And what you do is you ask 100 questions. You can come up with 100 questions. In my lab, we're asking questions all the time. And then you pick that one that is the key question that everybody's missed, though it's right in front of their face. And a good question is, what drives aging? You know, for 100 years, people didn't even care. Another question would be, how is it possible to reset the age of a cell? Where is that information stored? That's a really good question. How does it alpha ketoglutarate possibly delay aging or even reverse it? Great question. So that's where I would start. And then you could figure out the technology or even invent it or you know, get money to, to, to hire a company to do that. But, but don't try to figure out the next step using the current state of knowledge or the current state of technology, you won't see far enough into the future to get ahead of your colleagues unless you ask a really good question. Wonderful advice for those young scientists out there. Thanks again, David, for your time. You've been very generous. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Great to see you. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share, and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're not getting any younger, yet is made possible by a generous grant from the Navigage Foundation. The Navigage Foundation is enhancing the lives of older people through the support of housing, health education, and human services. Our podcast is produced by Vital Mind Media. Wellington Bowler is here with me, using sign language to keep me on course and recording the podcast. Stella, who I love spending time with talking about science, as you know, is our editor. With the creative direction of Sharif Izzat and the Buck Institute's very own Robin Snyder as the executive producer. If you are listening to this podcast, you know that there's never been a more exciting time in research on aging. Discoveries from our labs are moving into the clinic to help us all live better, longer. The Buck Institute depends on the support of people like you to carry on our breakthrough research. Please visit us at buckinstitute.org to donate and to learn more.